Uh, our next presenter is Associate Professor uh, Jane Fitzpatrick. Uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick is uh, associated, affiliated with the University of Melbourne. Uh, she's a specialist sports and exercise physician. Um, she has a busy private practice and, and obviously spends uh, some time at the University of Melbourne also. Um, Jane is, um, uh, had multiple positions uh, looking after Australian ski team, the Australian triathlon, biathlon team. So has a significant experience, uh, not only looking after lay community, uh, but also the professional sports people. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to, to Jane. Uh, and Jane is going to talk to us about the use of tennis sites in combination with uh, collagen scaffolds um, uh, for tendon repair. We know that um, some tissue requires um, intrinsic methods of healing. Some tissue uh, requires an external stimulus at a cellular level or a growth factor level. And some tissues we believe require a combination of the two. Uh, that's a combination of, of a collagen medical device to assist in the stabilization of the repair, but also to assist in the delivery of these cellular materials. And in this case, uh, a collagen medical device for the delivery of autologous tenocytes in the surgical field. So Jane, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul, and welcome um, to everyone. Uh, it's unfortunate that I can't see you. I do so miss our uh, normal dinner uh, meetings and hopefully they'll come back to us soon. Um, I'd like to talk to you tonight um, about the uh, a particular case that we attack surgically. Um, and I wanna talk about the underlying mechanisms behind the decision-making process and how that relates to the science that we have just heard so much about already. Why does it matter? Um, in our patient population, physical activity and the mindset are really where our patients are coming from. They all have the desire and the will generally to do better and to improve. And that's what drives us to make new decisions and to inform our uh, clinical decision-making process. So um, I think that's where we're coming from. For me, people say to me, what's the fuss? Hardly ever see gluteal tendinopathy. What's it all about? Um, the important things about gluteal tendinopathy from my perspective are that it is extraordinarily common, um, occurs in almost 10% of women over the age of 60, which is really quite a high um, prevalence. In these folk, they have really significant levels of dysfunction, which has been equated to this, the disability of severe osteoarthritis of the hip. And I don't think that's been well recognized, uh, particularly in our um, uh, medical populations. So for us, it's an important population. It's hard to manage. That's the other complicated problem. Um, I speak to our physios. This study came out of uh, Queensland, where I'm sitting tonight, uh, and the University of Melbourne. Um, and our physiotherapists have done a lot of work recently to try to look at what are the important things in that early phase of tendinopathy. And I think specifically the ones that are important are education regarding loading mechanisms um, and supervised or unsupervised exercise programs that do not overload the gluteal tendon. And we could in fact talk about that for a long time. And these are appropriate in this grade of tendinopathy, but I will draw your attention to the fact that even at world's best, um, which this paper might be regarded, um, you will note if you read it carefully that the patients reported that their pain levels were not significantly reduced despite having other things that were improved. So I think we've still got a long way to go in terms of the optimal um, exercise intervention. Again, if we talk about tendinopathy with no tear, so this is in that uh, group of uh, grade one, two, or maybe encompassing grade three, um, this is where PRP and particularly leukocyte-rich PRP has been shown to have a significant impact. So this is the results of our randomised controlled trial, which we've done out to two years, showing a sustained improvement um, and significantly better than corticosteroid injections. So in my practice and in my recommended set of uh, things, we probably would say that we're reaching a point now where we would indicate that corticosteroid perhaps has no role to play um, in the long-term management of this condition. 
But what happens, as Jeff very eloquently pointed out, to that 10% of 10% of 10%. So as we move forward, what we find is there are patients who are not responding, despite the fact that 90 or so percent might. And it's this group that we're talking about today. Um, I'm very grateful to um, Greg James and Ming Hao Zheng's group for doing this study, um, looking at autologous tenocide injection in this grade one, two or three tendinopathy group. And it's a good point to start to uh, introduce this treatment algorithm concept. So if you recall back to Zheng's slides where he talked about the changes in tendinopathy that we can see, um, including the angiofibroblastic hyperplasia, the degenerative changes, the eventual um, tenocyte apoptosis, and then structural failure. These are things that our surgical teams understand well because it's a progressive set of changes. And these are the patients that end up finding their way into surgical offices. So what I thought about tonight was um, to visit the surgical options and then explore our case. So if we look at um, tendinopathy with no tearing, um, then there are surgical procedures that we could use that uh, radiofrequency uh, micro debridement, um, and I'm hoping John O'Donnell's on the line here tonight who uh, did this beautiful study uh, looking at arthroscopic intervention using that compared to um, not use of uh, micro debridement. Uh, but this is only appropriate in patients for whom an intact tendon exists. And then once we start to see that the tendon is torn or we have a grade four tendinopathy, we're looking therefore at primary repair, and we could argue about that open versus arthroscopic. And for surgeons who are here, they'll start thinking immediately and what happens when the quality of that tendon becomes so poor or so degenerative, to use James' words, um, that it is hard to imagine that the repair will hold. And this is when we start talking about augmented uh, repairs with LARS or other ligamentous structures. So here's our complex case, and it's really just for surgical thinking and to make us um, reflect on patients who really have poor outcomes and who come to us looking like the hopeless case. So this delightful lady who I've managed to look after for some 10 years or so is a 63 year old female at presentation. And I've changed the uh, presentations into different colors here because she has so many facets that are important that I've, I've color coded them. So in red um, are our anaesthetist problems. She has recurrent pulmonary emboli, she has iron deficiency, obstructive sleep apnea, ischemic heart disease and obesity. So right away we know that this is not a lady that we need to operate on more than once. Perhaps we're not even keen to operate on her once, but we definitely don't want to be back uh, twice or any further uh, times than that. And from a surgical perspective, she has a 15 year history of lateral hip pain. This pain is not disappearing anytime soon. She has psoriatic arthropathy and inflammatory bowel disease and has been treated for these inflammatory conditions for quite a long time with her rheumatologist. And just to add some uh, salt onto the wound, she has uh, sciatica and ongoing osteoarthritis of the hip on the other side. So if we look at her more specifically, um, she's had this since 2002. She's had plenty of physiotherapy um, of 12 years duration and multiple courses. She's had all manner of load modification and strength work. Uh, she's had corticosteroids from every angle, blinded, unblinded, ultrasound guided, etc. She's had both oral and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. She's had the gold standard PRP leukocyte rich and still she presents with this MRI, a uh, very significant grade four tear um, that we see here from 2016. So she became a surgical candidate and we started to talk about the planning options. The anesthetic concerns are preeminent and very apparent. The surgical concerns are just as worrying with atrophic and degenerative changes in her tendon and the history of systemic inflammatory pathology, which is clouding the potential for outcome surgically. So could we do a primary repair with a suture anchor? Should we do an augmented repair using something similar to a Lars ligament, or should we be entertaining a tendon transfer? So hypothetically, um, these were the challenges, these were the opportunities, and we talked about this for some months. The surgical decision was eventually reached um, after much discussion and thought, 
um, and looking at the scientific literature. We decided to use a uh, cell grow collagen patch in association with autologous tenocyte implantation. Um, the idea behind this was to use a non-structural graft as a means to introduce the living tenocytes into the area of tendon to tendon and tendon to bone, tendon to bone interface in the expectation that this may lead to better long-term healing and outcome in a potentially poor surgical candidate. There was a possibility that this might produce less risk of graft failure and perhaps less risk of inflammatory rejection than other opportunities such as the last ligament. So that was our decision. It took us a while to get around to doing the surgery. Um, John O'Donnell very bravely tackled this case, uh, perhaps with much trepidation. Um, what we found was a gluteus medius tendon that was completely detached from the greater trochanter, atrophic and degenerate, but there was no visible macroscopic uh, in, uh, fatty infiltration. The tendon was retracted and scarred. It was hard uh, to pull back, had to be mobilized to allow for a repair and the usual cortical bone uh, decortication was done. Um, this was a primary repair using five transosseous non-dissolving -dissol stitches and a continuous dissolving stitch overlying. And the cell grow patch was overlain over that. And you can see that visibly here um, in the surgical uh, post photograph. What happened? was that uh, she actually disturbingly had a superficial wound infection, which thank goodness resolved and was not, uh, did not have to be attended to deeply. At 12 weeks, she'd gone from touch weight bearing to full weight bearing and was entertaining her beloved physiotherapy yet again. At six months, her pain had settled um, and she was walking without a limp. Perhaps amazingly, at 12 months, she had normal function in the hip and we were brave enough to undertake an MRI in 2018. And as you see here, there's a marked reduction in inflammation, an intact tendon, and a reduction in the atrophic changes in the muscle belly. So you can see the concern that we had in our preoperative thinking around the severe tendon damage, the systemic inflammatory changes, the idea of doing a primary surgical repair and requiring augmentation. And the decision that we made was that we knew from the clinical research that ATI improves tendon structure uh, and cellular morphology, uh, it improves biomechanical function and tensile strength. And if we could deliver a biologically derived collagen scaffold, which is designed to facilitate and strengthen adhesion between the tendon and the greater trochanter, without the risk of inflammatory response to the host and negating the need for surgical removal subsequently in this anesthetic risk candidate that we may have achieved what we wanted to do. So I'm delighted actually to say thank you um, to uh, John O'Donnell uh, for being brave enough to take on this case, to Ming Hao Jing and his teams and teams of people for doing invaluable research behind, to our patient who was brave enough to undertake this um, to Ryan, who was um, involved in the research all the way through, and to the concept of thinking that allows us to take a single patient and look at the possibilities that science is giving us and where that might lead in the future. So thank you very much for uh, entertaining my thoughts, uh, and we welcome questions as we go from here. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Jane. That, um... Uh, thanks very much, Jane. That was um, uh, quite a fantastic presentation and um, uh, quite a, uh, well, in fact, that's a, a global first, the combination of autologous tennis science uh, manufactured in a quality controlled um, fashion and manner uh, in combination with a collagen medical device to augment the repair of, of any tendon in the body. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. That, uh, that, that presentation and uh, delighted to have a look at those MRIs that they're doing. <laughs> so, um, so congratulations to you and John and the team. I might also mention, um, obviously, you just had that published recently in, in um, uh, the Journal of uh, Case Studies, I think. So um, I'll get um, 
all to turn their microphone on and I will uh, just have a couple of questions um, and I'll start the, 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 the questions. I've had some um, from the audience, which I'll incorporate. Um, and so uh, my first question, uh, Jeff, if I may, goes to you. Uh, and Jeff, in relationship to, um, you know, you've treated um, using ATI for lateral epicondyle tennis elbow. You've also used it for the rotator cuff. Um, and I'm wondering if you can give us some insights into um, what you perceive as any differences in that treatment regime, regime with, with ATI uh, in those two different areas. Well, it's, it's not so much the difference. It's, it's understanding how the ATI works. And I suppose the simple way of saying it is the tenocytes don't jump gaps. So if you've actually got a partial rotator cuff tear where one of the leaflets has let go, then I'm not sure that helps. I can't prove that, but that's my clinical impression. But if you've got one of those cuffs where there's an interstitial lamination tear, where if you put the cells in, they're going to stay around and do their job, then that is where I've had good success. And really at this point in time, it's anecdotal. We, we're very selective in who we use. We make sure that the injection of the tenocytes is done by an MSK ultrasonographer so that we know the cells get where they're supposed to go. Um, and basically my, my experience with that has been very promising. The, the, pro the, the problem is you've got to have a good quality MRI and make sure that what you're delivering can actually be um, achieved. Um, I have on patients used that um, uh, cell growth patch and it's this stage how, how the results are, are early and it's been promising. Um, but at this point in time, I haven't really fixed in my own mind when not to and when to use it. But the indication in my own hands is where it all always comes down to, because this patch is not structural, I have to be able to achieve a structural reconstruction. And then it is a race between the biology of that tendon to heal and not heal. So if I want to bring a, an augmented biology, I use the patch plus or minus the cells. And, and that obviously that decision-making is going to be part of the um, uh, of the infrastructure of how your insurance companies or whoever is going to pay for this technology. Excellent. That's a great answer. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'll just turn my next question. We've had a, this is one of the questions from, from the audience um, to Professor Zhang. Um, we know that in the different stages in the pathology and the different stages in, in this treatment algorithm, um, that at certain stages we see apoptosis and cellular death in the in the, 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 the tendon lesion um, but we also um, see it sometimes a hypercellularity uh, in the um, the pathology and the, the histology that we're looking at of this tendon perhaps professor Zeng, would you be able to just define a little bit about the treatment algorithm where that hypercellularity comes in and why you would be injecting autologous tenocytes at a later stage Thank you. Very good questions. Uh, hypercellularity, what we classify is uh, NGO fibroblastic hyperplasias. We typically, we see the early stage of tendinopathy. In the later stage of the tendinopathy, we can also see this, but it's not in the central area where the major pathology is. Most of the time, when you look at the the hypercellularity is at the peripheral area where there's no treatment is needed. So what we actually treated for those patients on the late stage is where the site when the cells being faced to the situation of information over mechanical load, as well as the deterioration of the microenvironment leading to the program cell death. As a result is further down, increase the metric degradations. So we often see this is a later degenerated change that where 
the tendon cells injection is needed. And this you can uh, often see like on the ultrasound or the MRI, you can like from what Jeff saying, those uh, rotated cup, the intrasubstance tear, you can actually see uh, the, 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 the signal stair, uh, a, a tear or micro tears on the side. And often when you see the micro tear, this is where the apoptotic cells occur. This is where there's no angio fibroblastic hyperplasia there. Otherwise, you won't see those micro tears. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for that response. One follow-up question for you, Prof, if I may. Uh, in relationship, I know that during the basic research um, period of the development of this technology, uh, you looked at a number of different sorts of cells, in embryonic cells, um, tenocytes, fibroblasts, MSCs. Can you just talk a little bit about um, why, as a researcher and a translational uh, a clinician, that um, you went down the tenocyte pathway as opposed to, say, the MSC pathway? Yeah. Uh, uh, again, good question. This is uh, the most easy way you want to take the uh, source of cells would be a bone marrow MSC that you can grow, but but bone marrow MSC is only a count of 0.01% of the bone marrow cells. And when you grow, we actually grow the stromal cells. And the time when we developed this, there was a lot of publications showing that stromal cells and MSC inject into tendon tissue. They form uh, from uh, heterotopic bone tissues inside of the tendons. And they prevent us from not going into that directions. Further down, when we discuss with the regulatory agency on the development of this technology, our advice is that we need to focus on what they call autologous use and homologous use. So homolog homologous use is you take the cells where they're coming from to back to their local environment. So as a result is, um, we consider the tendon cells could be the source of the uh, cells injection. Subsequently, the uh, uh, publication come out in Nature Medicine showing that tendon progenitor cells is also a type of the cells that are able to regenerate the tendon tissues and, and, and give us a lot of confidence that these tendon cells uh, should be a source for for clinical translation or to using the patients. Excellent, other well, thank you very much. Cells, other edipus cells is, that they use, I mean, it's a no, again, is a uh, follow those rule of no homologous use, uh, including skin cells and edipus cells, which is a way not really recommend from the regulatory point of view. Now, excellent, thank you. And I, and I guess that's where the stability of the cell line used and, and the ability for us to show potency, purity and identity for every single patient that is injected with human tenocytes really cuts to the quality and safety profile, uh, number one for this product and obviously some of the efficacy pieces that we've seen. Um, Jane, thank you, Prof. Uh, Jane, if I may, uh, to you, um, uh, you showed um, in your presentation a fantastic case study on um, uh, the blue teal tendinopathy uh, with a, a very nice combination of uh, both cellular, cellular aspects and the augmentation of that repair uh, with a collagen medical device that has bioactive uh, capability. My question is more about um, both diagnosis and, and assessments postoperatively. And I wonder if you could comment on MRI. And we know that MRI reading and MRI outcomes between rotator cuff, lateral epicondyle and gluteal tendon can often differ. And I just wonder if you could comment on, on how you approach that uh, from a clinical perspective. Um, thanks, Paul. Actually, um, it's a nice segue because it's a real problem that we have um, in terms of being able to reproduce um, MRI change um, and, and describe what the structural outcomes actually are. And in fact, um, we're about to publish a paper that um, talks about what we've called the M-HIP score, the Melbourne HIP score, um, as a way of defining um, the tendon severity scale on MRI. Um, and we've done the reliability and validity of it. 
So you've raised a really important question, um, and that is, you know, how we actually do that. Now, it's very important from the perspective of research studies, and obviously something that we'll be able to use as a tool um, in the next series of RCTs that might be moving forward. But from a clinical perspective, it's actually also important because if our radiologists can actually give us a grading score for our patients preoperatively um, or pre-treatment, I mean, whichever uh, treatment it is that we're using, and then post-treatment, um, we, can, we can discern what's actually happened um, from a structural perspective within the tendon. Um, and this is really quite groundbreaking because um, it has been said uh, that no treatment to a tendon will allow it to become normal. And I think um, we're just beginning to see a groundswell of change and a set of thinking that, that allows us to believe that actually this is not the case and that we can actually start to translate some of that into real tendon um, change and real pathology um, movement. The other thing I wanted to maybe just draw out whilst I've got um, the, the opportunity was that question around the differences between one tendon site and another and the application of technologies. Because in this particular case that we had, we've got this patient who's got pain for 15 years. She's not actually going to get better by anybody's standards, I think. Um, and it's probably remarkable that she has. Um, but if we look at um, the difference between a gluteal tendon and a rotator cuff tendon and the application of some of these principles through there, there are some profound anatomical differences between those two, despite many people saying that the gluteal tendon is the rotator cuff of the hip. So whilst they may have the same shape and they both um, enter, have a bone tendon interface, one of the real differences um, is that within the shoulder, there's frequently a delaminating tear on the um, intra-articular side um, and if you have a delaminating tear under a gluteal tendon, which we all recognize does happen, um, it's adjacent to the bone and there's no intra-articular component of that. So if you sort of think about overlaying these types of technologies, if you think about uh, doing an autologous tenocide injection, underlying a gluteal tendon is bone. Um, and it's hard, uh, much harder uh, to lose your autologous tenocytes into the wrong area. In the shoulder, much easier uh, and much more difficult to inject that, um, that inferior layer. So I think th these are conversations that we probably need to have uh, more. And obviously, as we're designing trials and interventions, think about more collectively. Um, but there are very real differences between one area and another. Yeah, I think that's... Can I just make a comment, comment there and... Which yes, please, Jane. An additional to Jane is that um, the, the additional thing that happens with many of these uh, lamination tears or tendinopathies is that lamination tear is not just intra, uh, a, a tear within a tendon. That lamination tear actually gets seeded with synovial tissue. And if you actually look at these lamination tears, they're actually lined with synovial tissue. And synovial tissue is designed not to stick together. These, these tissues will not heal. And so you have to give them a reason to heal. And that may be the, the trauma of surgery. It may be some biology in terms of tendon cells um, changing the way the live tendon on either side of that tear behaves. But you know, the, the fact is that there is not just a degeneration of tendon, there is an additional uh, adaption by the body to actually stop these lamination pathologies from actually sticking together. Yeah, it's a great point, Jeff. And I think, um, as we often know, that um, often successful outcomes are the bringing together of a number of different facets of the intervention. Um, you know, bringing together the, the mechanical stimulus of a repair, uh, the, the cellular aspects of, of, of a tenocyte, or indeed the biological uh, augmentation of the scaffold. And, and as I sort of mentioned before, you know, we know that some tissues can heal intrinsically, some tissues need a little bit of a push, and some um, tissues need to be taken by the hand and led all the way to the water to heal. Um, and so I think that, that that's a, a really good clinical description that you've just given on some of those differences. Um, and we see certainly in, in, in the clinicians that we deal with, um, getting to, to, to Jane's point, that um, you know, we have some orthopedic surgeons who will, and, and sports physicians and, and, uh, who will inject 
uh, themselves when they feel confident in certain tendons that are large and are, are, are dynamic enough or contained. Uh, and certainly in some areas such as the rotator cuff, it seems to be more of a radiology MSK specialist um, approach with, with the rotator cuff because of those added complexities that you discussed. Um, so um, in um, uh, mindful of time, and we said the webs uh, and I would go on for about an hour and 15 minutes, um, is there any other comments from our panelists before we wrap it up? Can I, can I just make a comment about how we evaluate the patients post-op? With the ATI post-op, um, we, we don't get too discouraged if their pain stays as a straight line for three to four months. What, what seems to be the, the prognostic um, sign, for me at least, is that if we see a sequential improvement in grip strength, um, then we, we will tell the patients, you are, you are actually heading in the right direction. And I think what's happening there is that um, the patients will measure, put their activities to a certain level of pain and they'll just stop at that, that level. But as, as, that, as they actually improve their um, common extensor origin symptoms, they will they'll allow a level of pain, but move up in terms of function. So if you're looking at someone with ATI, don't base it all on pain. Look at, look at their grip strength. And if their grip strength is improving, then you can actually be confident this patient is actually um, going through the various recovery phases that we see after ATI. I think that's an outstanding point. And we know that um, any regenerative medicine approach where you're supplementing an injured area of the body with a cellular aspect is going to take some time. Uh, and it needs to be able, those cells need to be able to do their work and the body needs to be able to adapt and secrete the, the type 1 collagen in the structure that results in better function and decrease in pain. So I think that's a, a fantastic point and one that we, 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 we do articulate with surgeons and clinicians uh, that even sometimes patients will have a reaction in pain at a very early phase, but we know we haven't healed the tendon at that time point. And so one must be mindful uh, to direct patients that it does take up to three months of that tendon structure to begin to um, show, you know, those dramatic improvements. Paul, I might just jump in and um, comment on one other thing. Um, I would agree with Jeff, um, and it's interesting that in the um, gluteal tendon, the timeframes are actually an identity picture, which is interesting, um, that we don't see significant changes until around about that three months, and then they kick forward. Um, and the other thing is to remember that extraordinarily pivotal slide that um, Ming Haozheng had that showed the sweet spot in the tendon, and that's critical in the recovery, that we need to understand that in the, re in the rehab, we have to engage with the patient and ensure that they have the appropriate load and that it hits that sweet spot, that we're not actually uh, getting them to do too little for too long or too much, and that, that that will help to drive it forward. So I think this sort of constant sort of reflection on the basic science and bringing that into our clinical medicine is actually quite important. And thank you so much, Jeng, for, um, for giving us those insights. No, I think that's absolutely a fantastic point in that, um, you know, those types of um, uh, regimes that we're using with the patients are based upon basic science work that's been done. And, and so the, that, 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 that approach is an evidence-based approach and, and I'm delighted to have, as you say, Prof Singh to do that. Prof Singh? Yeah, as I echo Jeff's uh, comment, pain is a multiple factors. Uh, there's so many factors in, uh, associated to pain. The grip strains is, is a reflection of the structural repair. So it's a way of on the preclinical, the clinical studies, if tendon cells for this regenerative medicine approach is to aiming for structural repair by substitute the cells, then you can see this functional outcome, the, the structures repair is good. On the other hand, when you look at uh, uh, our preclinical studies, it, uh, tendon cells does moderating inflammation, inhibit the inflammatory response. And, and if a patient do have some situation, some 
some uh, information is this or uh, like what do you say the synovitis uh, is this and this is uh, uh, persistent information in the local environment then and in those cells if they can modulate those uh, interaction to reduce the inflammation reaction then pain will also resolve but with strain so I agree is the most important one is the reflection of the structure uh, outcome. Excellent. Um, I just uh, will wrap it up now and just uh, let our audience know that uh, we're more than happy to take questions following the close. Um, you have our details and happy to, to transfer those any of those questions to our clinician panelists uh, today if you so desire. Um, I'd like to uh, say that I think we've had three outstanding presentations today, um, giving us some very strong insights into how to effectively translate a cellular therapy from an idea, a concept into the clinic in a safe and high quality method that garners uh, uh, efficacy over a period of time through randomised and other studies. Um, we've seen uh, some great insights into the use of ATI in an upper limb practice um, from Dr. Hughes and, and again, the outstanding presentation. Uh, and then last but not, not least, um, uh, hearing a, a very novel approach of using scaffolds and cells combined together to treat a very, very problematic patient. And so delighted uh, to hear your insights, Jane, not just into that case study, but some of the other work that you've done in and around this area with your PRP and ATI and, and now with this combination product. And of course, thanks to, uh, to John O'Donnell for his uh, splendid hands and work in, in, in that um, operative technique. So um, some insights into clinical practice and certainly some greater understandings into an advanced treatment modality that fundamentally addresses the underlying pathology and provides us with the ability to treat patients at the right time point with the right intervention, uh, with the right follow-up to enable these patients to have the very best chance of success. So thank you all for your, uh, your time tonight. Thank you all for attending. And it's uh, goodbye from Orthocell and all the, uh, our, our, our guests tonight. Thank you and good evening.